History of photography. Let's start out with the very first picture that uh, included a human being in it. And this was in the 1830s. Louis Daguerre. And um, it was a very laborious process. Um, I'm not sure if this was glass plate, but it was magic to be able to do this. Some of these exposures, I think, were, uh, pr prior to this, were uh, several minutes, might be 15 minutes, uh, crazy things like that. Um, and you can see the darkness around the edges. Uh, the lenses weren't so great. Um, how, did, how did they, was it just the trial and error when they uh, first started with, you know, exposing it? Expo you know, the plates to, to get the picture? Um, I haven't talked to him recently. Oh, okay. But, <laughs> but um, they were experimenting with a uh, collodion gel. Right. I don't know what that means. But on um, surfaces, uh, not glass at that point, but surfaces, and they found that they, they could kind of burn an image in and then treat it so that it wasn't going to be um, uh, fading or getting black, just like in black and white photography. You put something in a stop bath and, and then you would put it in a fixer. So whatever they used back then, they found, uh, oh my gosh, we can do this. Uh, and now you put a lens in there and you can project on there. Holy cow, but now what? So there were tint types, things where it was not glass, um, but you'll, has everybody heard of a tint type? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so those were some of the very first pictures. Um, and what they were were primarily representational. Uh, I don't think you'd call this landscape, but they were just taking scenes. It was a, a novel kind of a thing. It almost looks like a painting. It doesn't, it? yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and that's probably a combination of the lens not being entirely sharp, but they're brushing this chemical onto a surface. So I think that also... Uh, creates some of that. Now, hold that thought about painting because we're going to get back to that concept. Uh, when we go further, we're going to jump ahead to the 1860s. And it has uh, you know, improved significantly on the lens sharpness, the ability to get those uh, in between tones, that sort of a thing. Uh, these would be on glass plates uh, so that they could make prints by, you know, contact prints, basically. Uh, these exposures were still several minutes long. Oftentimes, uh, the person sitting, you can't see it, but there would be a brace behind his head, so he wasn't moving. Uh, you know, and then consequently, uh, it's very static. Uh, the expressions, I, I don't think people were told back then, smile, right. <laughs> or how could you hold that for a long period of time? Uh, this was Matthew Brady, uh, very famous for having a salon, I think, in Washington, D.C. Uh, photographs at this point were mostly portraits. They were recording um, people and events. So um, one of the very common things, well, here's an event. This was the earthquake, San Andreas Fault, uh, and showing things like that. Now what people are more familiar with is Civil War. Little grizzly. grizzly uh, they, they they moved the bodies to take the picture. Well, exactly. That was the I, uh, one. Really? Tita and a friend of mine who's into that, uh, he said that they actually 
position the bodies yeah. where they yeah. wanted to fit. And I said, wow. I, I mean, and I, I said, well, what was the reason for that? And they said, well, it was just because they wanted to sell their photographs, you know? The more grisly or the better they thought it was unbelievable. Well, in addition to that, uh, it took them a couple days, oftentimes, to get to a battlefield. The equipment mm -hmm. they had to bring were, uh, it was a covered wagon yeah. of some sort. All this glass and chemicals and so on. So the bodies could have been moved. Uh, you can kind of tell, I think, on this one, uh, they are already started to bloat, yeah. that sort of thing. Uh, but you're right, uh, they oftentimes recreated scenes. Now, uh, the whole debate that's gone on forever is, so is it okay to manipulate a picture? Uh, this would be sort of Photoshop of the day. <laughs> Analog approach to it. Uh, and then these would be displayed uh, you know, back home, sold in the studios, uh, historical archives, things of that sort. I don't think at this point they had the ability to put them in newspapers. Uh, here's a hospital showing people who knows if that was manipulated. Uh, so history uh, is, is also something. Now, the next phase that is commonly seen is depictions of conditions. In this sense, very popular. Um, and this was, again, some news reportage. Uh, shorter exposures at this point that made it more possible to do this. It's probably still, you know, a, a few seconds in this, but people are static there were um, opinions, in a sense, muckraking. Newspapers wanted sensationalism, and this particular person, Jacob Rees, uh, was involved with social activism, child labor, living conditions, crime, things of that sort. Uh, so kind of uh, early social justice. I love this picture. Here's a, you know, foreboding alley, uh, tenements, and so on. You know, all the derby hats, and he's got a club right there. Uh, same person photographing the conditions in the mines, both adults and, and kids. Here's another one with all the kids. Um, terrible conditions. Uh, this was an 11-year-old girl uh, in the uh, the mills. The mills, yeah. That's where they make the, what they're called. The cloth. Down, down and twisting the machines. Yep. In the textile industry. That yep. Usually it takes, for I think, 10 machines like that. It, two women were able to do it. When I was on strike down here, it took eight guys to do it. <laughs> they did it, you know, in record time, and they do it. It's yeah. 22 of them. So then from there, and this is uh, somewhere in the 30s. Uh, bu -bu -bum. Yeah, well, no, around the turn of the century. Now, all of a sudden, we have this Leica 1, 1920s. This is the very first commercial camera uh, using 35 millimeter film, and uh, it revolutionized things. Now all of a sudden you've got uh, a compact camera that's fast. Um, you can walk around with it much more easily than a lot of other cameras. Uh, what I have here on the table uh, the far one, one on the right, uh, that's probably about the same vintage, that Kodak. Yeah, that's a, That was my father's camera. Yeah, I, own, I own one like that. And he bought it used. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's called an autographic camera. 
uh, on the back you can slide down a little slide there's a scribe mm -hmm. on that and you could actually with the pressure of that scribe make a note you know saying this is uh, Aunt Susie right whatever is that like a is that German made the Leica, the Leica, yes. Yes. Yeah, I have my dad's Agfa. Yeah. Oh, was yeah. In Germany oh. during the Korean yeah. War. Yep. Can you hold it up and down like that? How you doing? Uh, yeah. <laughs> hold I it. Mean, I mean, the uh, it's that's the way you hold it is up. Well, it looks, it's tall. Yes. Or you do. Well, side. you can you, turn you it because you can see sideways. the eyepiece that you can yep. rotate. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and that film is like. Uh, 620 film or something. Yep, 620. They stopped making that a zillion years ago. Yeah, they did. Uh, but it was a big negative. Yeah, the she said you, with the your finger you could make huh? like make a note or something on it. Uh, a, or scribe. a scribe. A scribe. Yeah. Right. It's like a pen, but okay. with uh, no ink. And the pressure that you would be putting on the uh, actual negative would turn out to be you know, black. When really? it was processed, so it was way ahead of it because now you can yeah, do that right. on the new cameras. Right. You can, you know, that's the, right. Phones, yeah. you can do it. Yeah, the, right draw, on your the drawback on to my dad's Agfa hmm. is that you can't tell whether you have film in the camera, oh, yeah. and you can't tell uh, how many uh, pictures you've taken. So he sort of there was no counter there was on no it. No counter on it. Oh no, wow! No, he knew how to turn it. But like I said, the fault was you couldn't see whether there was a canister of film <laughs> in there. Take a hundred pictures. Because yeah, usually, oh I'm, I'm, no, he missed my sixteenth birthday because he thought there was film in there. <laughs> and um, <laughs> he did the same thing at my college graduation. Yeah, no, the film was in there, but he read the meter wrong. Yeah. So the settings on the outside were wrong. So like the major events in my life, <laughs> there are no photos. <laughs> I only see the malfunction in there. But just, I have just a memory. Still, I mean, oh, it, his it's, light meter. Uh -huh. and I mean, it, it just it brings back happy and sad memories. Yeah, all <laughs> yeah. the ones I didn't get. <laughs> now, Can you the, tell when it was over? Like, no, he the thought, roll, like, film was he was rolling end. on my 16th birthday. He was rolling it back, and he popped it open, and he was like, I exposed the rest of the film. Uh -oh. It's like, oh, there's no film there's in the nothing. camera. Yeah. And it was like, you know, your party was over. Now, the camera, the lights company was famous for lenses. Right. And they ultimately were involved with the Nazis uh, with some of the, the best optics in the world on that. Uh, not at this point. Now, that's 35 millimeter. Who knows why they chose 35 millimeter? Yeah. I have no idea. I have no idea. Well, you why? have the 620, you got the 120, you know. Well, this uh, so popular, it's because there's movie stock. Oh. Um, they were That's making right. movies in 35 millimeter film. Yes. Oh. So it was already being manufactured. Um, and it, obviously it fit in there. You can imagine the size of that camera. Uh, so, so that started that whole trend. That's the first 35 you did? First, um, well, yes and no. Uh, it was the first really, really functional right. 35 millimeter. In what year? 1925. 25. Yeah, 25 wow. Yep. Oh, yeah. So it allowed for things that were more motion. So here we have uh, Lewis Hine also kind of a social activist um, and just a little later than uh, the previous things that I was showing. So men at work, here we go, same kind of thing. And I could show you more of those but you've got the idea. So at this point there's the issue of painting or drawing versus photography. Uh, photography was considered um, just a tool, a reporting tool, um, and the photographers really wanted it to be considered more art and in competition with painting. If you think back to pre-cameras, a lot of the bread and butter of uh, painters was what? Portraiture, 
and landscapes and reportage of you know significant historical events um, they're considered art because of the artful ways that they do those things but it was an economic decision very much so so now cameras are taking over uh, you know, they can no, they will very effectively compete at a cheaper level with uh, painters uh, so photographers going further they want to uh, emulate art and be considered at the higher arts level so now we get into I'm not quite sure why they named it this the photo cessation, cessation uh, movement where soft focus things that look much more like uh, paintings and in fact this is Stieglitz Arthur Stieglitz um, very famous photographer he's even got a paintbrush you know, in his hands so this was all the rage and they were showing in galleries uh, moody sorts of things like I say soft focus uh, things of that sort. Where's that? Uh, that's the Flatiron Building in New York. Oh, wow. And at that point, there's nothing around it. Yeah. And so they're doing that sort of thing, uh, that sort of thing. Then they, <coughs> bless you. They still have. Uh, the business of portraiture and so on. So not everything is soft focus. Here is uh, one of the robber barons of the railroad. And, you know, sitting for his portrait, he was very impatient. Uh, what he's got is not a knife, but he's sitting at, at a chair, and that just happens to be a, a chance reflection. But, you know, it was just a, a great picture and social commentary as well. Uh, but isn't it true that earlier portraits like photographs, people saw that as a sign of wealth? Yeah. To be able to have a photograph of yourself? Well, a studio, yeah, but uh, it was so much cheaper. If you think about back in the... Civil War, there's all these pictures of soldiers. Yeah, that's, we um, have a picture of my grandmother from 1905. Yeah. What her birth a picture, she was like three or four months old. Yeah. That was a little bit, it was accessible to the everyday person right. because of price. Think about that as a painting, how long would that take? I don't know. All the hours. Yeah, so right. if it were a painting, that would be. They were like, that's uh, for a wealthy person. Yeah. Yeah. Because you didn't want anyone to know that you had them. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it was like sick and twisted. Sick and twisted. So, and then we have things like this. This is Rodin. Uh, so portraiture started to be a little bit more interpretive. And this is uh, somewhere around 1900, 1920. Uh, thereabouts. So we go a little further, and again, that sort of a misty feel. Uh, it's historical, uh, but it's more of that kind of emotional sort of thing. Now we are coming to the 30s, um, the Depression. There was um, a, a government agency, the uh, WPA, Work Project Administration, and they set about, among other things, uh, to document what was going on at that time, living conditions, so on. Uh, a lot of the old football stadiums were WPA projects, you know, sort of make work, we've got all these people unemployed, you know, rather than welfare, mm -hmm. let's get them to work. What a concept. Uh, so, anyways, now we go to things like that. 
That was the Dust Bowl. Is that Dorothea Lange? It's what? Is that Dorothea Lange? Uh, it is, uh, yes, yes. And she um, was one of those. There were several very famous photographers that I think got famous from this time period. And again, they had um, faster cameras, very portable. Um, here was Dorothea Lang too. Yeah, just, it just some great, great pictures, and it it shows what's going on. And we have here we go, Margaret Bourke White, social commentary. That was a bread line. Uh, she went on to do quite a bit in the magazines, um, as did some of the, oops, wait a minute, let's get back to, uh, it's out of control, wait a minute, where am I, here, okay, now, of course, at this time, um, newspapers were doing very well with pictures, uh, anybody know what the halftone process is? Newspapers only print ink. It's just all black. Right. So the letters are black on plain paper. So they figured out half tone, which are little dots. So if you were to blow this up, it really is only black and nothing. Um, and if you space them further apart, you've got gray, or it appears to be gray. So that was a big breakthrough. Uh, you know, um, years earlier, the pictures would be uh, drawings, uh, woodcuts, everything that was, again, just black or nothing. Uh, so it opened up a huge um, industry for this sort of thing. Uh, interpretive things. And uh, let's see, news. So the Hindenburg, it wasn't very far from here, Lakeland, New Jersey. Um, and at the time, I don't know if, if you've ever seen it, there's a newsreel of this whole thing mm -hmm. and somebody that's narrating it and it's riveting. Uh, I'm sure you can find it on YouTube. Um, so the uh, recording of history has really never gone away uh, for, for photos and you can't imagine somebody that's painting this as a re recorded history. Things like that, which talk about photo manipulation, uh, they say that this was reenacted. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. They did it the day before, and then the photographer. They, I, I know all about that stuff. Yeah. This is the day after. The yeah. Day after. Yeah. I think the photographer couldn't get there or something. Uh, whatever the reason, um, they recreated. So again, is is this we consider this history? Uh, but they've created recreated something actual. Great portraits, Joseph Karsh. Now, jumping back, uh, inventing the road trip. <laughs> and here you can see that's, uh, that's actually recent. That was just in the Wall Street Journal, but that would have been recreated. That's way back, uh, not long after the early 1900s. Um, but this is foreshadowing. We're going to be talking about um, our tourist pictures. Uh, <laughs> what a great thing to have a road trip and take pictures. Now we start getting into, um, again, this is street photography. And that has been a craze since uh, I think this is about the 40s. Uh, yeah, I think so. 
Uh, and again, Cartier Bresson documented so much in, in Paris, uh, and it was these moments, uh, the decisive moment. Anybody hear that phrase? That would be referencing, uh, you can't control this guy, but you pay attention and anticipate what's going on. And I've talked about anticipation before. Uh, you know, the idea that you just happen to be at the right place at the right time, you know, that's luck. How come a lot of people, some people have more luck than others? Because they're anticipating. You know, you've got it ready. What was the phrase you used? The decisive, the, 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 the decisive moment. Yeah. Still true. All right. This is Paul Strand. Uh, that's a realistic situation. It's probably somewhat composed on all of that. But, you know, just visually rich kind of pictures. Uh, kind of a street photography still. Uh, again, kind of a dis decisive moment. I don't think this was uh, um, planned. That's Albert Schweitzer. Now, all of a sudden, we've got all these magazines that uh, they're so dependent on pictures. Um, and, of course, we know them. Life magazine. The start of Disney World. John F. Kennedy Jr. Yeah. yeah. And just from the, I think it was the 40s, early 40s on, you had Life magazine and then the competing Look magazine. Um, and so evolving further, Rolling Stone and Am Annie Leibovitz was incredible. She photographed so many covers and they weren't just simple portraits and she would get people to do the craziest things. Yeah. Yeah. Now, they probably did this on their own. <laughs> <laughs> In this case, they suggested it. <laughs> yeah. Well, so Leibovitz also does the uh, was it this the sports the sports uh, swimsuit? Uh, oh really? Yeah, she, she does sports illustrate. Yeah, yeah. Oh she, really? Yeah. Oh, a swimsuit. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, she's she's extremely. I've never. Yeah. She's. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, this is where she got her start. She was uh, in her twenties. Mm -hmm. Didn't know much about photography. This picture was? Uh, in no. Her 20s? no. No. She oh, started oh, with Rolling Stone in her 20s. Oh, she started there with And they needed a photographer. I'm happenstance, I'm reading the autobiography of Jan Wenner, W E N N E R, who started Rolling Stone. And so he's talking, you know, all these guys and gals are in their 20s. They don't quite know what they're doing. It's the whole hippie movement. Um, it was a magazine that was basically to write about uh, bands and pot. So that's where she got her start. You know, and there was all kinds of the social upheaval that was really <coughs> uh, pictured a lot. Now, and I'm Sad that uh, Ken can't be here for this. He would, you know, all the painterly things and whatever, he'd uh, go crazy about that. Uh, now is realism. <laughs> he would love realism. Sharp focus, um, wow. landscapes. Ansel Adams uh, was the epitome of that. And he goes back to the idea of view cameras. So these 8x10 view cameras, um, painstakingly composing things and uh, processing himself, 
dodging and burning and using all kinds of different uh, ways to get it just perfect. And he'd document that. So you'd see this picture and it would say what camera, what lens, what paper, the ca you know, everything that was done that way. And he was tremendously uh, successful on this. And these are a couple of his very famous ones. He also was a master at selling his work. If you think about uh, you know, where do photographers get their jobs? And early on there was portraiture and some of the reportage. Uh, oops, I've got to plug this in. Um, they've taken away the bread and butter of painters uh, in those areas and painters at this, this time are gradually moving away from realism um, to abstract and part of that influence has to do with uh, they want to differentiate themselves from um, photographers and be able to you know, sell their work in some way. There we go. Okay. Uh, but he had galleries. Uh, still his work is controlled by a trust set up. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, going ahead to things where who's going to buy that? It's going to be in a book. It's artistic. This is the same Harry Callahan. So that, this is his wife. Uh, that's Callahan. What's this? Nope. Okay. So Callahan, his, uh, one of his big things was the alienation of people in cityscapes. Um, you can kind of imagine it in, in this particular picture. Um, very successful. Him, he was one of my teachers at the Rhode Island School of Design. Um, they had books that they would sell, of uh, you know, kind of coffee table books. When I was there, it was, quote, fine arts photography, and I would ask questions in classrooms uh, about, well, okay, uh, we're covering this topic. How is this going to apply to a ph photography studio? And they'd just kind of look at me and wouldn't say much. It was They'd go on, and I'd ask some other questions that way, and... Yeah, Am I asking the wrong questions? Well, commercial photography was a dirty word at that point. And so anything motivated by uh, you know, a, a subject matter for Life magazine wouldn't be considered art. Uh, and again, a, a different flavor of photographers trying to emulate uh, art. Uh, Let's see. What was the school? Rhode Island, Island school, school of Design. Design. It's kind of mica on steroids. <laughs> RISD. Yep, RISD. So I enjoyed my time there, but I realized that I was kind of stuck, had to complete it, and uh, it was going to be a lot of years for me to learn something more commercial about it. Uh, and it did, it worked out, but um, I wish that RISD had more of a commercial edge to things um, because what's, you know, how is this not commercial when they sell them in books? Right. And then the other thing is, oh, I see, if I were a fine arts photographer, I would support myself by being a teacher. You know, that's how this works. Okay. So, uh, geometry was also a big thing. 
That's where Paul Strand, that's a good example. And then we have, and this would be probably the 50s, we have people just exploding all of those concepts. You know, uh, that is Dolly uh, as a portrait. Studio work, you know, uh, that probably sold very well in a magazine and probably uh, at this point the original is in a, in a gallery. Then in the 50s we have a different kind of reportage and street photography. Uh, Robert Frank uh, really was a pioneer in a lot of that. Uh, this book, The Americans, is a really, really good example of his social commentary on uh, the 50s uh, American. Here's another one. Then we go to um, more commercial photography studios and we have famous photographers doing covers and advertising. Richard Avedon. Uh, and he would do all kinds of crazy things this way. Very successful. He had a whole series of pictures where it was kind of straight ahead portraits, uh, full length, and he would just have the people jump. So they'd be six inches off the ground. He had the royal family Wow. Doing that, wow! Back and the thing. you know, it was uh, you know, here's the Beatles, and oh, that's a great picture of the Beatles. But now you have them jump, like holy cow! What a concept! Now, uh, a lot of these were black and white, even though color was, uh, you know, very. Uh, advanced uh, during all this time period but the power of the black and white uh, Ansel Adams he started to experiment in uh, color and it was a total flop nobody was interested and you look at the pictures if this were in color uh, in some ways it wouldn't be as interesting Okay, so now you hardly ever see much in the, in black and white. Um, you've seen a couple pictures of Meyerowitz uh, that I've shown before, um, and what he's doing here, I think, is it's evocative of a, a summer cottage that you'd have. And you look at these pictures and you just kind of feel the warmth of the sun. And there was a whole series on these. And I think that's where I stopped. I didn't have time to go any further. But there you go. What are people's com comments or questions? But I do think that at this point, like if you were at, at Rhode Island School of Design, they they changed things up. They have some. Because yeah. I have I have friends that have gone into other art programs, not specifically there, but like Micah has a commercial. Mm -hmm. out of, and then I have an, a, one of my friends, um, her sister went to Kent State, and she was required to take classes in how to market yourself. Really? That's great. That's and really her amazing. thing, Fantastic. her specific thing that she did, not photography, but it was art related, was restoring fireplace, like marble fire, like right, yeah. in old houses. Yeah. And she would be hired to go to a place and literally restore fireplaces in places like Hampton Mansion right, yeah. such. So and she would so she be in there. The but they taught her how to market herself. 
Oh, okay. So that she could get jobs doing yeah. that. And she's yeah. actually insanely successful at it. But I think that, it, I mean, it's just like anything else. I majored in physical education. It, you don't major in that anymore. There's so I many think things. Charlie, you said trades. Right. Yeah. And there again is the kind of contrast. Is art a trade? Uh, there were painters' guilds. That's right. Yeah. Sure. And we call it art, and it is, but it is a job. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Sure, because all the famous artists were, were hired by the wealthy to make their, you know, have yeah. their picture of, uh, painted, you know, for the most part. And that's how a lot of them. Are. Well, I mean, it, it also corresponds to the, yeah, music, how many, the musical industry the same way. Yeah, how many people when you were in school were wanting to do the same thing you were? Not many because most had a dowry. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, there you go. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, <laughs> I would imagine there would have been more. There were a few. There were a small number, but most had their nose in the air. Yeah. I'm uh, going to create art, uh, and uh, I don't care what other people think. So you'd have critiques where everybody would put their work up from that week or that month, and if you had a question that was not totally positive, they would kind of blow it off as, well, I don't care what you think because this is my personal expression. End of conversation. With all of that. Wow. I thought it was hard to be graded. Yeah. Well, it was a pass fail. Oh, oh wow. Yeah. Wow. Yep. Did anybody okay. ever fail? Um, I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know. It, I mean, it's, it's interesting. Yeah. Because you see how education has evolved. Sure. Just the way you. Exactly. Uh, you know. So let's you see know, if I can. If I was born 20 years later. Yeah. I would have well, been in sports marketing. Right. Exactly. As opposed okay. to yeah. teaching yeah. physical education. Teaching. Right. Exactly. I would have been working for like the yeah. Orioles or the Ironbirds or something. Right. Something like that. 